Hello, and welcome to Great Times Behind the Wines. This show is your inside look at what goes into successfully running a winery in New York State's stunning Finger Lakes wine country. I'm your host, Shannon Hazlett Hartz. My mischievous orange tabby cat, Hoover, who is quite similar to the mask, quite similar to the mascot of our best selling wine, Red Cat, will also be chiming in as always. My family runs the winery that is the focus of this show, Hazlitt 1852 Vineyards, and has been farming the land around the winery since 1852. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Hoover, that's Perhaps most recently in the area, many wineries have been increasingly focused on sustainability initiatives to preserve the remarkable natural resources that produce world-renowned wines and make the region a top tourist destination. These include its cool climate, beautiful natural views, views, and clean, clear lake waters. Hazlitt is among leaders in these environmentalism efforts. Our expert guest today to discuss this topic is John Santos, Hazlitt's vineyard manager. For a little background about John, he is a 1990 graduate of Cornell University. In 2009, he helped Hazlitt receive the Schuyler County Conservation Farmer of the Year Award for the sustainable vineyard practices he helped implement at Hazlitt, which include a composting program. This program involves using the winery's waste, such as grape pumice, out in the vineyards. Let's let John take it from here if you at Hazlitt's Hector New York Tasting Room in late March 2021. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today, John. So, you hear sustainable farming talked about a lot, especially in the wine industry. Could you please explain what sustainable farming is and why it is so important? The concept of sustainable Especially in the wine industry. Could you please explain what sustainable farming is and why it is so important? The concept of sustainability as a business model started with Paul Dolan at Fetzer Vineyards. And it involves three aspects. Economically viable, you have to be socially equitable, and you have to be environmentally responsible. The part that most people think about when they think about farming is the environmentally responsible portion of the three E's of sustainability. What are the things that, uh, the things that uh, people are doing to be more sustainable? There are... There are several areas of the farm that people are looking at in terms of wine grape growing in the east where they can be more environmentally responsible. The first would be the uh, soil fertility and the sequestration of carbon. So that's sequestration of carbon in farming is becoming more and more of a big deal as far as uh, global climate change is concerned. So for like a grain going from tilling to no-till, because every time you turn the soil over, you're adding a whole lot of oxygen to the soil, and that oxygen fuels bacteria breaking down the organic matter in the soil and releasing some of that carbon. As C uh, and, and Cornell has been doing a fair amount of research in this area is going to some sort of a cover crop under the trellis and then mowing underneath the trellis rather than cultivating underneath the trellis or having an herbicide strip. I'll be chiming in with definition. An herbicide is something, usually a chemical, used to kill or prevent the growth of unwanted plants such as weeds and invasive species. And Cornell has shown that there's less leaching of nitrogen there's also less leaching of the pesticides that are applied in the vineyard through the soil horizon into the groundwater. Soil horizon into the groundwater. Soil horizons are layers of soil underground that are shaped by living creatures and other forces of nature. So that's one big area that, that people are looking at. And um, we are currently making the move to a perennial under the under the trellis cover crop. Most people are using annuals because in our area we need to hill up underneath the trellis to cover the graft union of the vine to protect it for winter. 
A graft union is where a vinifera vine, or a vine native of Europe, is grafted, or joined, with the roots of a vine that's native to North America. This helps the vines survive in their non-native habitat. The trellis is the primary part of the vineyard that provides support and suspends the vines above the ground. The uh, method that we are going to use is we are going to go to a perennial cover crop with mowing, and then we're going to bury the graft union with, and we're going to bury the graft union with compost. So that will address, and the compost will address another area. You can see as much as a decrease in vine size by one third by having a cover crop underneath the trellis. So that, that could lead to lower yield. But by applying the compost underneath the trellis, we'll be addressing the nutrient availability in the soil and also adding more organic matter and more water holding capacity and hopefully we will achieve a balance between the hopefully we will achieve a balance between the the devigoration of the cover crop and the invigoration of the compost oh wow very cool thanks for describing that and for listeners who might not know you know what is kind of the alternative to using a cover crop um, you know, and why might that be an issue in terms of sustainability? Well, the, the first under the trellis cultivation, which every time you do the cultivation, you're going to be burning out some of that organic matter that's in the soil and releasing CO2. And generally it takes four cultivation passes over the course of a season in order to keep the under trellis area relatively weed free. The other alternative to that would be herbicide strip. And uh, there are several ways in which that works. So the first is pre-emergent herbicides. What pre-emergent herbicides do is present, uh, prevent weed seeds from germinating. So these chemicals, and so therefore they can also contaminate groundwater and present some environmental problems. The other method for controlling weeds underneath the trellis would be post-emergent herbicides. The most commonly known one that, that people would be aware of would be Roundup. One that, that people would be aware of would be Roundup. And there are issues with Roundup as well, not the least of which at this point is that weeds have, we have selected for uh, weeds that are resistant to Roundup by repeated use of Roundup. So now um, this is a very big issue in field cropping, grain cropping, because they use genetically modified organisms that are resistant to Roundup. So they plant soybeans that they can spray with Roundup, and then they use Roundup for weed control. And because they do this after year, they do soybeans, then they do corn, and each of these crops is Roundup ready, and they use Roundup repeatedly, and it's like taking the same antibiotic all the time you select for the bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic. So you're selecting for the weeds that are resistant to the Roundup. That kind of can make it difficult growing grapes? Uh, well, we're definitely seeing increased heavy rain events and more warm, humid weather. And so this presents a, a real challenge to us as far as fungal pathogens in the vineyard. You describe the fungal pathogens? The fungal pathogens that we, the major ones that we deal with would be powdery mildew, uh, downy mildew, phomopsis, and black rot, but also botrytis and sour rots. And the sour rots are actually bacterial in nature, actually bacterial in nature and fungal in nature. So it's a combination of yeast organisms, which are fungi, and then bacterial organisms that uh, create acetic acid, and that's why it's called vinegar rot. So the powdery mildew, downy mildew, these pretty much any of the above ground tissue can be affected by those diseases. Although powdery mildew is a quote unquote dry, it doesn't require rain, it, but it does require humidity. So anytime the relative humidity is above 90%, you have an infection period with powdery mildew. Downy mildew, infection period with powdery mildew. Downy mildew requires rain and temperatures that favor it are around 70 degrees. 
So as we have warmer fall temperatures with rain, we're now seeing downy mildew infection periods extend farther into the fall than they used to. It means having to do more spraying, um, which is challenging and uh, also challenging to make it more environmentally responsible. Now, luckily, there are several ag chemical companies now that are specializing in bacterial fungicide. So they're selecting bacteria that, that naturally live in the environment that uh, either outcompete or essentially kill the fungi, fungal pathogen. So some of them produce chemicals that uh, inhibit the fungi, and other ones will outcompete them for the the surface the the surface area on the plant itself so you you spray these bacteria and they colonize the tissue the surface of the tissue they do not cause any harm to the plant but they basically exclude the fungi from the surface of the plant john then described how he first got started other sustainability initiatives well it's been along a spectrum so uh, the old the old adage was you know like a a hundred pounds of nitrogen to the acre a year and this, so this was chemical nitrogen and then we, we kind of weaned ourselves from that kind of weaned ourselves from that over time lowered it down to uh, at, before we stopped applying nitrogen altogether down to 25 pounds to the acre per per season um, so now the only nitrogen we're applying with uh, is is with the compost, the, the nitrogen that's in the compost. And so that that nitrogen in the compost is tied to the organic matter and is only released as bacteria break it down. So it's only mobile in the soil when temperatures are warm enough for the bacteria to act, bacteria to act on it and when the plants are actually growing. It's not readily leached through the soil horizon. So that was one thing, but it, it was, again, it was along a spectrum. It was a, it's a kind of a continual evaluation of, of what you're doing. So it, it started before the compost, it started before the compost with reducing the nitrogen application to what we felt we actually really needed for the plants, um, rather than kind of applying it in, in excess and knowing that they had enough. We were trying to find that point where what is need and not anymore so that we're not uh, contributing to the pollution. It also saves you money. So it's more economically viable to apply 25 pounds than 100 pounds. So that, that would have been one thing. Another thing oh, would have been looking at uh, getting rid of certain at uh, getting rid of certain chemicals from the spray program, which were more toxic than others. There are caution, warning, and danger labels based on the toxicity, the danger to humans and to the environment, and kind of moving away from the danger label as much to the, to the caution labels as possible so that we're applying things that are more environmentally friendly. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted, you mentioned that, you know, the um, vineyards need nitrogen. Can you just explain, you know, wh why they need nitrogen? What, like, role that plays? Sure. So, uh, vines need, vines need nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, a little calcium, magnesium, boron. And uh, through soil sampling, you can determine the availability of the nutrients that are there. And then... With each and every season, when you harvest from the vineyard, you're removing a certain amount of nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus with the fruit. So you're, it's not a closed system. You're constantly, every year, you're removing some nutrients from the vineyard. So is there enough in the soil to soil to account for that? Or do you need to replace what's removed? So through soil sampling, you can determine, is there enough in the soil that this isn't a problem? Or is there some kind of deficiency that needs to be addressed? 
And then how do you address to have low potassium levels in our soils? So, like humans, soil can be low on potassium, too. Unfortunately, it's not as easy to fix as just eating more bananas, as John explains. And so we, we needed to apply chemical potassium, which was muriate of potash, which can muriate of potash, which contains chlorine. But we went to a system where we tested the soil, and we do this every three to five years, depending on the vineyard. We test the soil, we look at the levels of the nutrients, in particular potassium, and then at the crop load that was removed. And so there, we, we then calculate from the crop load removed using a, a set figure, uh, how much potassium was removed from the system. And we say, is there a deficit? And how much did we remove? If so, we need X number of pounds of actually cubic yards, X number of cubic yards to the acre of compost to address the deficiency and the amount removed. And so through doing that over time, our potassium levels have come up in the soil and we know them up in the soil and we no longer have any soils that are deficient in potassium. And the amount of compost that we need to apply in any individual vineyard to address what is removed is just that, just what's removed and not nothing more. And so it's we're trying to have that equilibrium where we're, we're basically replacing the nutrients removed from the vineyard with those applied in the compost. And nitrogen would be another aspect, but nitrogen is a little more difficult uh, than potassium to determine because there's not a lot of, of uh, because there's not a lot of, of uh, nitrogen in the compost and only about a, a third of that is actually plant available in any season. But your previous years, compost still has nitrogen that's plant available and the year before that still has some in, in a decrease you have this multiplier effect where over time you're building up more and more nitrogen because you're building up the organic matter in the soil so you, it's not like you want to address like the total amount removed by the crop and with the current year's application because you're still getting nitrogen from the nitrogen from the last five years of compost application it becomes a little more of a complex calculation now john could you please describe what the compost consists of so the compost comes from our grapes so we pre we press the grapes here at the winery and the the pumice the waste material from that process goes out back and gets piled up and it gets blended with horse manure and wood chips and uh, that is the compost just a quick note you don't need horse manure to compost at home you can find a lot of great resources on composting at home today such as ep8.gov forward slash recycle forward slash composting dash home Check out the show notes for this episode for this and other links to learn more about composting. Um, so the pumice itself is rather acidic. It's got a very low pH and it's very difficult to pH and it's very difficult to compost pumice purely on its own. You will, you will find that a year later you can still recognize parts of the grape within the pile because it, the low pH prevents it from composting efficiently, quickly rises and you get to neutral. In fact, uh, some of the pH we apply, uh, the compost we apply is basic, almost a pH of eight. So it's a beyond neutral, it's basic in nature and will actually slightly raise the pH, actually slightly raise the pH of the soil over time if you're applying a lot of this compost. Yeah, and now do we compost food here at the winery? It's I know when I work behind the bar, sometimes I we take the popcorn out and we put it in like an old bin. So is that pop popcorn uh, composted? It is. Um, as the compost goes, the material goes out. Um, if it's not buried immediately, wildlife will eat it. So <laughs> it gets oh. composted in a different manner. <laughs> oh well, yeah. But yeah, we've had special events where all of the food waste was composted in fact uh 
I compost on my own farm. I'm currently sifting compost, which came from your wedding. Oh my gosh, <laughs> several years ago. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I have a spot in the garden where I know it was Aaron's wedding because there was a lot of uh, seaweed added to the comp the the lake weeds, and so the, the the lake weeds, and so there's a lot of zebra mussel shells. There's another spot where it was uh, Jason's wedding because there are just all these oyster shells everywhere because he had the raw bar with the oysters and the clams. <laughs> Jason and Aaron are my cousins. We all had weddings on the love road from where the winery's original Hector tasting room is located. John kindly composted all of the food from the wedding meals. Who would have thought that compost could be a way to preserve memories? Now, John, can you please describe the unique sprayer that you helped develop that, if I understand correctly, helps better target and reduce the use of certain pesticides? So what, uh, one other strategy... That, if I understand correctly, helps better target and reduce the use of certain pesticides? So what, uh, one other strategy for control that we've used on our larger blocks of grapes where the, where the, the vineyard is very large is uh, I have a separate spray tank on my sprayer. So um, I developed this with Doug Hazlitt. Doug Hazlitt is the co-CEO of Hazlitt 1852 Vineyards and, in full disclosure, is also my father. We've been using it to control Botrytis bunch rot. So Botrytis, most of the Botrytis materials, we're, we're getting materials, are specific to that fungi and need to be applied directly to the fruit. And so it means a separate pass if you're trying to uh, control botrytis versus trying to control powdery mildew. But oftentimes you're trying to control things like powdery mildew, trying to control botrytis. So we created a sprayer with two tanks, separate nozzles just for the fruit zone. So we could put a botryticide in the fruit zone tank and have another fungicide that controls powdery or downy in the main tank and it would be one pass through the vineyard. John then described how he has used one pass through the vineyard. John then described how he has used this unique targeted sprayer that he developed with my father to control an insect that can be particularly damaging to commercial vineyards. It's called the grape berry moth. To control berry moth, knowing that berry moth really affects the edges of vineyards and a very large those with only one really woodland edge like we have on our breakneck creek site that it's only a problem by the woodland i could put an insecticide in that front tank when i'm spraying the rest of the vineyard and i could spray the first five panels from the from the the woods out and control berry moth without spraying the entire vineyard so i'm using a lot less insecticide uh, saving money that way and uh, yeah not treating the whole vineyard when I don't have to being able to spot spray spray unfortunately Doug and I did not get a patent on this uh, <laughs> you know that farmers we innovate we don't seek patents and stuff like that finally John can you please describe the rainwater collection that I believe the winery does from the warehouse roof we have a, a 15 gallon tank and that 1500 gallon nurse tank that we fill our sprayers with collects rainwater. We fill it with municipal water normally, but in between sprays, we leave it down. And if it rains, the tank gets filled up with rainwater. The tank gets filled up with rainwater. And so we're not using the municipal water, which had to be pumped from the lake, the, the lake well and treated and pumped up the hill and then come down through the water system to us and we're not paying for that water it was used to move the water to get it to us we're just collecting water off the roof of our building just one more question he's described just kind of i guess overall you know uh, what the importance of sustainable farming is to you so we've we've spoken quite a bit about the environmental aspect and that's that's always been always been a really important part um, for me uh, being environmentally responsible and uh, having as little impact as I can you know it was a concept 
that I learned in Cornell, in Cornell at uh, when I went winter mountaineering. So my gym, my freshman year was during January break. I went winter camping for nine days in the Adirondacks with instructors from Knowles. And the whole idea with Knowles is no impact. You're trying to enjoy nature, enjoy the experience with no impact to the environment. And uh, I've tried to uh, move that way within my own life. Uh, we've installed solar at our house. We've gone to uh, at our house. We've gone to uh, heat pumps for for heating and cooling in the house and the heating of our hot water. So the solar energy is providing the energy for the most part. Of course, things run at night. There's no sun at night. So we are to offset all of our electrical use with the solar. We're trying to go as carbon neutral in our own lives as possible. And an extension of that is doing those same things again on the farm. So that's one of the E's. The other E's would be, you know, socially equitable. So P's would be, you know, socially equitable. So paying people a fair wage that are working, uh, offering them benefits. Hazlitz has done a great job with benefits to their employees. Also social equity within the company, things like Supporting Santa. Seneca Santa is a nonprofit that a group of businessmen from the village of Watkins Glen started in the 1940s. Its mission is to provide underprivileged children up to age 12 with Christmas gifts. It relies on community donations to make this possible. Hazlitt Winery hosted this event for many years and still plays a part in fundraising f efforts for it. Since it began, the event has raised over $260,000 for children in need. John also mentioned that Hazlitz helps animals too by supporting the Humane Society of Schuyler County, <coughs> which my cat Hoover approves of. These are all things, charitable organizations that Hazlitz has, that Hazlitz has supported over the years. So all these things that are dealing with social equity are another spot where uh, we're striving to be more sustainable by being a better community member. I know Hoover, all the drinkers, but also those to come. And of course, I also really appreciate his time describing them in such great detail. Additionally, I must send out a big thank you to Derek Strybeck for the wonderful custom music and to Stephanie Jarvis, the winery's director of marketing, for all of her editing help. And thank you, dear listeners, for spending your time. And thank you, dear listeners, for spending your time checking out this show. If you'd like to learn more about Hazlitt's sustainability initiatives, and if you'd like to purchase wines made with these efforts in mind, visit hazlitt1852.com. If you'd like to see the gorgeous natural landscape of the Finger Lakes wine region that John and others spent some time at one of our tasting room locations, the original is in Hector on the shores of Seneca Lake, and the second is in Naples, New York, near Canandaigua Lake. Until then, take care and cheers!